greetings and please do not adjust your devices because we are back. Yes, half term is over and whilst it was nice to have a little break, it's even nicer to be back embarking on more adventures in history with you all in episode six of the English Heritage History at Home live series. I hope you enjoyed your week off. I certainly did. And I even gave myself a trusty new companion in the shape of this little bean. This is Olive. Olive, say hello. Hello. Uh, she's my nine-week-old cockapoo. You'll be pleased to learn that not only is she a certified cutie, uh, but she's also a history-loving hound. And her favourite English heritage site is, of course, Rufford Abbey. Uh, she joins me, Ben Shires, from my new location on the floor of my garden room at home in York, primarily so I can keep an eye on her, can't I? Uh, and also to make sure that she doesn't attempt any uh, amateur archaeological digs out in the flower beds. And as always, I'd love to know where in the world you are at the moment. Uh, and also this week, what your favourite stories and legends are associated with castles. It could be about knights and chivalry uh, or the castle themselves. Whatever it is, pop them in the comments. Hello, you. And we'll try give you a shout out. As well as that, we'll also be answering your questions on to, uh, today's topic at the end of the show. And of course, setting a brand new creative challenge. Right now, though, I need you to cast your minds back to two weeks ago and our episode on Dover and Dunkirk, as it's time to take a look at some of your monumental medals. First up is Rose, who's nine, and Poppy, who's eight, from Birmingham. Rose has drawn a tank and the word valour on hers, and Poppy drew herself in camouflage in the bushes with the word honour. Uh, both have included rainbow ribbons with their medals. They're absolutely fantastic. What great artwork. Next up, we've got Alex with his medal featuring Dover Castle and the White Cliffs of Dover. And look at the intricate detail and fantastic colour on that medal. I love that, Alex. Uh, next, we've got one from Erin, who is 11. Uh, and Erin has drawn an incredible anchor, which I love. It's so detailed and accurate. And that blue iridescence on it is amazing. I've never seen anything quite like that. And uh, lastly here, we've got uh, designs from Joshua, who's age 13, and Jake, who's age 8. Both brilliant in their own ways. Both included those lovely uh, rainbow ribbons as well. And such energy and enthusiasm in those designs. Brilliant work. Um, I would say as well that uh, those are fantastic efforts. You all deserve a medal for those designs, but you've already made them. So maybe design a, another medal for that and give yourself that instead. Um, but brilliant, brilliant work. There'll be another uh, different creative challenge for you at the end of today's episode. But right now, it's time to scale the walls of history once more and crack on with Castles Part 2. Now, regular viewers will have seen us lay siege to the history of castles in Episode 3, where we discussed castle development and defences, took a guided tour, experienced a siege, uh, and perhaps most memorably, marvelled at medieval plumbing and now, if you haven't seen it yet, you can catch up on our Facebook videos. They remain there on our Facebook site. Watch them wherever, whenever you like. Please don't go watch them just yet, though, because we've got plenty more for you today. This time round, we're going to be learning about how castles were used, the knights who lived in them, and their teal, uh, tales of deeds and chivalry. Uh, so who better to play our knight in shining armour once more than uh, Jeremy Ashby. Now, unfortunately, it appears that Jeremy's internet connection at the moment uh, is about as reliable as the ones that they got in the Middle Ages, because we haven't got him with us. Uh, what we do have is Olive, who is playing incredibly boisterously. She's nine weeks old, as I mentioned, and uh, she is in that stage. You'll know if you've ever had a puppy. She's explorative, She's fun and friendly, and she likes to nibble things. At the moment, she's nibbling my shirt, aren't you? Um, which we don't want. Uh, but I can't wait to take her to some uh, English heritage sites when it's safe to do so. Uh, but right now, it's safe to introduce, I think, Jeremy Ashby. Jeremy, are you there? Hello, Ben. Hello, everyone. Nice oh. to be back with you. Thank goodness, because I was going to have to start asking my questions to Olive, and I'm not sure she's as much of a castle expert as you are, Jeremy. I uh, don't know what happened there. Um, my technology is back in the 13th century, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, don't worry about that. Um, we're back now and we're back in business. So let's talk about castles in this second castle episode. 
And I think when we think of castles, we tend to think of knights, don't we? Uh, in shining armor, mounted on horseback, upholding chivalric cold, uh, uh, codes, even uh, rescuing damsels in distress and being generally, well, quite dashing. Um, so, Jeremy, did all of that actually happen or is it a construct? I mean, for a start, did knights even really live in castles? Uh, yeah, the good ones are like that. Uh, they genuinely did exist. They genuinely did sometimes wear armor and they genuinely did get to live in castles as well. In fact, I mean, you know, the, all of the the Im the legends and the things that you see on the telly uh, and images like this. Here's, here's a, a strapping gentleman at Walkworth Castle in, in Northumberland. They all have some basis in reality, even if sometimes people didn't quite live up to the, to the ideal. I see. So obviously knights, as we know them then, did exist. But how did someone become a knight? I imagine that there weren't that many of them about. And certainly if you've seen a, a modern knighting ceremony, if you've seen someone be knighted, it's, it's quite formal, isn't it? I mean, dare I say it's even a, a tad boring. There's lots of bowing, lots of formalities, a carefully placed ceremonial sword, has it always been done that way, all a bit sort of stiff upper lip, or did it used to be maybe a bit spicier? Uh, it had its moments, but one thing I would say is they didn't want to give knighthood to any old bod, so they wanted to make sure that you were the right person. And one thing that does seem to be true is that there, there would be a bit of ritual um, associated with it, sometimes spicy, sometimes, frankly, a bit, bit bonkers. And still my favourite <laughs> is the ritual of, of Knights of the Bath, which is just what it says on the tin, that in order to uh, be made a knight, you'd go through this initiation ritual, which would involve getting your kit off, getting into the bath and being visited by someone more important than you, who, while instructing you on the duties of knighthood, would splash water all over you and presumably wash away all the griminess of your life hitherto and make you the kind of person that you should be and it would really literally go being a knight means you must be loyal to the king splash on head uh being a knight means you must you know be dashing and chivalrous to relieve oppressed maidens splash on one shoulder um being a knight would mean that you must uphold the honor of the holy church or oh, you've missed a bit there sort of you know loofah over, over halfway up the back and so on. Um, that's how you got to be a knight. Wow, it all sounds uh, a little bit odd, doesn't it? And, uh, I think you've essentially knighted me there, Jeremy, by reciting that ceremony. So <laughs> I accept to promise to uphold all the uh, the knightly codes there. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out as well that those, those people who were being uh, knighted, uh, they didn't have the suit of armour on at the time. It would have started to go rusty otherwise, and nobody wants that. Uh, we'll come on to armour in a minute. But there is uh, another uh, knightly order that interests me because of its pure weirdness. So tell us about the Order of the Garter. Okay, yeah. The Order of the Garter um, has its origins in what I think we would like to call a wardrobe malfunction. Um, the story goes that King Edward III, um, he was a king in the middle of the 14th century, uh, was at a ball at Windsor Castle and he observed that uh, many of the men in his court were having a bit of a laugh at the expense of a lady, the Countess of Salisbury, who, according to the legend, her garter that held up her stocking had fallen off and her stocking was, was dripping down. And he basically said, having a laugh at a woman uh, in having a wardrobe malfunction is not the kind of person we are. Behold, I will make the garter the emblem of the most prestigious order of knighthood that I can get. Um, and he made some people Knights of the Garter, which, you know, they, they I think would have the right to feel a bit shortchanged. In other countries, you get something heroic like the Order of the Golden Fleece. And, you know, he's making people basically the Order of the Underpants. But nevertheless, it still exists. And, you know, Knights uh, of the Garter still, you know, the best people in society uh, get made a Knight of the Garter by the Queen. So it still happens. They are some prestigious pants then, Jeremy. Um, now, we mentioned armour there, and uh, I think it's very difficult to think of knights without thinking of their armour. So 
let's talk about it a bit because how did they come to wear armor in the first place because it looks very uh i don't know it, it, it's hard it must be hard to move in it is it it looks very uh distracting if you're trying to fight what was the benefit of armor well there's all sorts of legends about armor that it, it's so impractical that for example you know if you fell over basically you lay there you know and and you couldn't get up again and if uh, you know if you needed to get on your horse you you know you had to have a, a crane that would lift you on this is absolute nonsense although i have to say one yeah. anecdote that i can give you about castles and and knights in armor um which I, i'm pleased to say I've, I've seen with my own um eyes is that if you wear spurs that the, the the pointy bits on the back of your boots it's almost impossible to go up and down a set of spiral stairs which castles of course are quite big on so there is a bit of impracticality about it but the serious point is this armor is is you know with this is the protective uh metal um armor that you, that, that you wear on the top it's only one of many parts you'd have to wear it over many layers underneath and if it's been properly designed it will fit you literally like a glove it will distribute the weight very evenly around your body so even though you might be wearing armor that's you know 65 pounds which is 30 kilograms in weight you know that's a lot actually it's no more impractical than say a modern fireman wearing full kit and breathing apparatus when he goes into a burning building um and you know famously firemen have have great freedom of movement so if it had been as impractical as all that i don't think they, they would have wanted to do it absolutely i mean we uh the, i've heard rumors that they might have had to get out of it using a tin opener we'll put that to one side for now uh in some of the images that we saw there jeremy uh the armor was perhaps unusually from what people might consider very brightly coloured, wasn't it? There's lots of uh, designs and insignia around it. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I can too. Um, and that's the, 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 the there's there's a few words that we've got to use. Um, we've we've talked about orders of knighthood, and there, there's a word chivalry, which is basically the term that means you know the the, the kind of being on your best behaviour, the kind of standards of, of behaviour that we expect a knight to have to be a gentleman, basically. But another word that you can use is pageantry or, or even heraldry. And heraldry is really important. Heraldry is basically the rules of, um, you know, having, having a, as it were, your insignia, which goes on your shield. And so that, you know, on the battlefield or on the tournament ground, everyone knows who you are. They will see that, show, that, that they see the, this brightly coloured imagery and they'll go, oh, that's Ben Shires, Sir Ben of Shires over there. We know that. He's a he's a, you know a, a knight to uh, to be careful um, of, and 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 they will behave appropriately towards you. So that's always been a part of the uh, of the code of of knighthood. There's there's always quite a lot of flashiness, quite a lot of display about it. And as the Middle Ages goes on into the late Middle Ages, and indeed into the Tudor period, that doesn't go away. In fact, it reaches the point eventually where actually the dressing up and play acting almost seems to take over. But it has its origins, of course, in a matter of, of deadly seriousness, actually what you're going to do when you go into battle and how you're going to you know, uphold the, uh, the, the, the honour of yourself and of your family and, and indeed of all the people that you're connected with right up to and including the king. Absolutely. And I suppose that makes sense as well, because when someone is in a full suit of armour, you can't tell who's behind there. So the the uh the insignia insignia the heraldry that that gives you a clue and i suppose it was in the knight's best interest to make that as impressive and and potentially as intimidating as possible so even if you couldn't see the face of the man that you were fighting just one look at his shield and you knew that he meant business yeah and there's actually one other really important point as well one of the rules of chivalry is you're only supposed to fight against people, as it were, who can take it. People who are of the same kind of level as you. It's regarded as incredibly bad form to uh, to have a go at someone who's who, who's who's undeserving. But one of the uh, counterparts about all of that is in battle as a knight, yet wearing this this um, heraldry might well indicate that actually you were quite rich. So if you got into trouble, uh, maybe rather than kill you, they'd say, okay, we will now hold you hostage in the hope that your friends and family will will buy you out uh, and so it might actually be the thing that will save your life um as, as as well as the thing that will actually you know stop you from getting shot 
Well, very interesting. And talking about saving your life, at least in, in one sense, I have a great worry that if you are wearing a suit of armour, one of the pressing issues, quite literally, would be how do you go to the toilet? Because uh, I'm going to be honest with you, Jeremy, I wear braces, as you can probably see, and I have to think ahead. You know, I've, I've got to manoeuvre myself out of my own outfit. So how did knights do that? Well, Ben, I think that thinking ahead is probably one of the things that you were instructed as when you became a knight for that very reason. Because, you know, frankly, this one goes into the into the box, uh, the quite large box marked historical questions to which we don't know the answer. How did you go to the toilet? Um, a suit of armour is really difficult. And as I say, the armour bit is only, you know, one of many layers that you have to wear underneath. So while it's technically possible to sort of undo yourself a little bit, you know, down at the bottom. Uh, it's, it's hard to know how, how to put this delicately, but, you know, you could you could free yourself up. Um, it's not something you do, you know, terribly easily, and you certainly can't take off the full set of armour. So I've sort of looked around about this a little bit, and, you know, the best uh, answer I think I've seen from anyone is they say, you know, if you're fighting in battle, you might well have other things on your mind as well. And um, perhaps, you know, that kind of inconvenience is is, is, is really going to be the least of your worries. But otherwise, you know, in the tournament, for example, I think the rule must have been make sure you go before you go. Yeah, absolutely. And if you just desperately need to go, make sure you put your sword down first. That must be a golden rule. Now, uh, you have answered my number one question about number twos there, Jeremy. So thank you for that. And I think it's high time we take a look at some of your comments. Uh, and here's some of your favourite castle-based stories too. So I'm going to uh, go to the uh, comments page, compiled as always by uh, the lovely Charlotte. And uh, Charlie, what have you got for me? Jo Sturdy from Salisbury uh, says her favourite legend is from Old Sarum, the story of the arrow and the deer, uh, which decided where the new cathedral would be built. Fantastic. I'm sure some of you know that one. Sarah Cox, its uh, favourite story is the legend of... <laughs> of night comings at Barnard Castle. Yes, it's a modern legend, that one, I think. <laughs> uh, hello, Ben and Olive from Noah. Thank you, hello, Noah. Uh, Tom and Dexter as well. Uh, the Border Collie, I think that's Dexter the Border Collie from Berry. We love knights and play fighting with our shields and swords. Fantastic. Might want to stick around for our challenge later on then, fellas. Uh, Ethan and Isaac Bishop are watching from Ramsgate. Never miss an episode. Thank you very much. They love Dover Castle. Um, hello from the Netherlands. Hello to you. One of my favourite castles is Tintagel Castle in Cornwall. Well, got a special treat for you, perhaps, coming up shortly. And uh, can we have a shout out for Devon, who absolutely loves your series. He's nine years old and lives in, is it Quemerford? Apologies if I've not pronounced that right, Devon. But sounds like a very interesting place. Thank you. As always, keep those comments, keep those shout outs coming in. Uh, as always, we want to know who you are, where you're from. And this week, what your favourite castle or knight and chivalry legend is. Um, well, uh, lots of our viewers uh, have obviously enjoyed going to English heritage sites, Jeremy. They might have seen uh, a jousting event there. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, though, these would have been more than just a couple of fellas trying to knock each other off their horses, wouldn't they? Can you tell us about what these tournaments actually involved? The, the sort of quite rigorous and strict code of sportsmanship that actually governed them. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a really big deal. And I mean, at the heart of it, you that you know, even if the knight isn't going to war, he's practicing the skills, the kind of skills that he's going to need to do. But because they have this code of chivalry, of good behavior, in a way, it's a little bit like sportsmanship now. Um, you know, when they're, they're actually doing this thing that, that if they do it badly or they do it... Uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in intending to, to do someone injury, they could do them really quite serious damage. But the, you know, if you were to go to a place like Kenilworth Castle, the um, certainly, you know, they, you would have seen on special days, you would have seen tournaments that the um, causeway that leads into the castle now, it had one tower at each end. And on the roof of that tower, um, people would stand and they'd be able to watch as two knights went racing along this this long narrow space you know at, at one another with a bar down the middle with the intention of with their lances with the intention of scoring a point by by hitting the other person and interestingly um what you were trying to do is not to image, injure the other person that would be very unchivalrous uh, you actually weren't really trying to knock him off his horse either. What you were trying to do is break your own lance. 
and they are designed that they will that the, the point of it if you score a point if you score a hit in the correct place it will actually break off and we know for example from score sheets that survive that henry the eighth who in his younger days was a very uh, enthusiastic jouster actually was really pretty good it wasn't that people knew who he was and let him win actually he broke his lance quite a, quite a few times because he was he was he was an ex expert uh, jouster but as well as the sporting spectacle there would be you know a lot of pageantry a lot of parading about it's a moment for you to wear your best armor to show off um, you know your your show off your skills and to let everyone see who you were what a what a deserving chap you were um, how well connected you were and your heraldry would, would would have all of these messages so there'd be lots of music there'd be lots of you know a lot lots of shouting out of of, of charges and and, and and responses where people say will you fight yes i will and and and, and off you'd go go to it it would have been you know a very very great and and elaborate spectacle when you look at somewhere like kenilworth or walkworth castle you know it's it's not that difficult to imagine it it's a, it's a perfect counterpart to the to the really flamboyant architecture of castles at the end of the middle ages I tell you what, Jeremy, a bunch of overdressed, pre strutting around and trying to show off. It sounds like I would have fit right in uh, in the age of pageantry and uh, tournaments. Uh, and, and I suppose it, it illustrates it as, as well for us that we think of castles often as a place for actual fighting, but more often, perhaps, they, they were hosting mock fights and entertainment. You mentioned Kenilworth Castle there. Um, and I think we know uh, a lot about Kenilworth Castle. It was a seeming hotbed of pageantry and passion. And there was a particular person who lived there that was, was trying to use the castle and its environs for his own advantage, wasn't he? Aha, uh -huh. I know you're thinking of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who uh, he's after the Middle Ages. We're into the Tudor period now, in fact, specifically the reign of Elizabeth I. Um, he uh, was the owner of uh, Kenilworth Castle. And um, there's lots of, you know, this is in the county of Warwickshire and there, there, there's other quite flashy castles nearby, Warwick Castle. So he really needed Kenilworth to, 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 to be brought up to, to a very high level. And he had another agenda as well. He wanted to get the Virgin Queen to marry him. They'd been, they'd known each other all their lives. And I think she was pretty keen on him, but he was a com commoner. So he was going to have to look like the kind of person that the queen would 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 want to marry and so he um works really hard to make Kenilworth castle uh, a castle with all mod cons it's 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 the kind of castle that, that a billionaire footballer might well want to live in it's got you know hot and cold water it's got you know very fine windows it's got absolutely gorgeous um uh, go, uh go, go, gorgeous gardens uh, and it's got one other thing as well that we haven't talked about so far is what um, the other thing that, that they like to do as a leisure pastime is to go out and go hunting. In fact, I mean, right through the Middle Ages and afterwards, chivying wildlife across the countryside, killing it and then eating it later uh, is one of the favourite things that they've all got to do. And Robert Dudley, uh, as well as owning Kenilworth Castle, uh, he had a gloriously big hunting park around the outside. So in the summer of 1575, um, it was very hot summer, so sometimes it was too hot for any of that, and they had to do indoor stuff. But uh, when the weather allowed it, he got on his horse, he got her onto her horse, and they and their friends went out uh, into uh, the uh, park around the outside of the castle and hunted deer. And literally, they hunted them down till they were by the edge of the water, and then they then they had them killed and taken back to the castle in order either to be eaten or to be given to their friends. Um, so hunting, really big thing in castles. Well, I mean, uh, uh, to conclude that story, I'm sure many of us will know that uh, Elizabeth I never married. Uh, so for all of his, uh, his wooing technique, it turns out that chasing deer to the point of exhaustion and then killing them didn't really work for Leicester. So uh, perhaps not something that we'd think about doing nowadays. But hunting, like you say, Jeremy, was a, a huge deal. Uh, in, in the Middle Ages and, and afterwards as well for uh, the certain class of people who would live in a castle and wanted entertainment. It was uh, part of the, the real sporting uh, activity of the day. Um, do we know other castles where they essentially became just a, a, an outpost for massive hunting parties all the time? 
Yeah, well, uh, all the time is probably exaggerating it a bit, but uh, Framlingham Castle, another one in Suffolk, another one that we haven't really talked about too much yet, but a really, really grand castle. Uh, that is another one that came with its hunting park and um, Restormal, which I uh, outed myself a few weeks ago saying in Cornwall, that's one of my favourites. Uh, that's another one where um, it's in a, this glorious landscape where still owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, which is which is, has its bare bones, the, the hunting park. Uh, I'd say one thing, though, about hunting, where you've got uh, hunting is the sport of the nobleman, but uh, poaching is also the activity of uh, people lower down the, down the scale. So if you've got deer and you've got a park, you're also going to have to be quite careful to make sure that the deer stay inside uh, and that everyone else stays outside. And certainly we know for uh, castles like Framlingham and like uh, Restormal, that actually the people in charge of that castle, the constable, would probably also be the park keeper. And he would probably have to spend more time dealing with poachers and making sure that the that the deer were, were where they're supposed to be and in the right numbers than they actually would do in looking after the castles themselves. Yeah, it's a startling fact, really, isn't it, that uh, despite the fact that castles are there as these massive fortifications, they probably spent most of the time battling against poacher, poachers rather than actual invaders. Um, and, and as much as the, the age of knights and chivalry was a spectacular one, no matter how much armour they wore, no matter how big a castle they built, they eventually couldn't repel the arrow of time, which marched on and things began to change. So how did everything start to come to an end, Jeremy? When, when did castles and knights start to become unfashionable? Well, OK, I'm glad you mentioned fashion because that's a part of it. But uh, towards the tail end of the last session that we did, someone asked a very, very good question about the end of castles. And we got onto the subject of gunpowder, about cannon and things of that kind. And I said then that it's a simplification that when cannon came along, castles became redundant. And I stick to that. Actually, if you go and look at uh, late medieval castles, so Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. Here's a picture of it. Uh, here's the gatehouse at Carisbrook Castle. This is what greets you when you arrive. And you'll see towards the bottom of that picture, there's a traditional sort of cross-shaped arrow loop for bows and arrows but if you have a look up the top of that tower you can see a whole line of things that look like upside down keyholes and those are gun ports those are some of the earliest installations for firearms that little cannon would be sticking out of those gun ports you, the, the the people behind uh, would be able to see through this the, the slit and if anyone came too near you would fire at them now there's a long period where traditional medieval weapons and cannon coexisted and cannon certainly didn't take over but as time went on cannon got better and bigger but also something social happened that to operate a cannon is a very complicated technical thing really you've got to be a professional soldier to do it to do it well and so as time goes on you see this split where fortifications become increasingly about the technical matter of operating these cannon. And I know in a later episode, Roy Porter is going to be talking about Henry VIII. And I think we'll be talking about some of the coastal castles or forts that Henry VIII built. So I'll save talking about that uh, for, for, for that later time. But you do increasingly see a split. Certain noblemen and knights um, don't really want the grotty business, the grim business of, of needing to look after all these cannon and all that lot. And they decide they don't want to have anything to do with castles anymore. They will go off and live in country houses. And so unfortified country houses, places like Stokesy Castle or, or you know, there's a picture of it later. Doesn't really look much like a castle anymore. Um, that's the, there's a gatehouse and it's in timber rather than in stone built uh, the first half of the um, 17th century. However, some people still were living in castles and in the middle of the 17th century, a very horrible event happened, the English Civil War between the Royalists, the forces of King Charles I and parliamentarians led famously by Oliver Cromwell. And that did involve castles and it did involve cannon. So one story that I love to, tell, to talk about is the story of Goodrich Castle in Herefordshire, where it was in the Middle Ages, this was like a country house. It was a very fine very flashy building and of course it doesn't look anything like that now and the reason why it doesn't look like that now is one very specific um gunpowder weapon called a mortar 
and mortar with a nickname the nickname was roaring meg and roaring meg was largely responsible for reducing goodrich castle from this very spectacular fortified mansion um to the the, the to the, the empty shell that it is now well i suppose if you're going to go out you may as well go out with a bang um to explain more here's a video about roaring meg at goodrich castle John, what have we got here? Well, this is a working replica of an English Civil War mortar known as Roaring Meg. The original was built in 1646, uh, and unlike a cannon which shoots level, this is designed to lob cannonballs over the walls of castles, and then they would explode inside, doing as much damage as possible. So we are actually going to blow something up? That's the plan, yes. We're going to load this with powder, we're going to shoot a cannonball out of it, and uh, hopefully do some damage. So cannonball fires, cannonball lands, cannonball blows up and does damage from inside. That's the general plan. How yes. much gunpowder are we using here? Okay, so we would normally use four pounds of powder in a hollow cannonball, uh, and then we'd use another three, three and a half pounds of powder in the breech to launch the cannonball from the mortar. And how accurate is this thing? Can you, can you hit a target with this? Um, they're not designed necessarily for hitting specific items, but we're gonna give it a very good try. We did think about firing this at a real castle, but that's not a good idea. So instead, we're going to use the British standard for destruction on camera. Full disclosure, leaning into a cannon to light the fuse on a cannonball just before it's going to blow is a little too risky for the 21st century. So we're going to fire a regular cannonball, and after it lands and crashes in, our pyro team is going to replace it with charges and blow those up. But to you, it will look seamless through the magic of editing. You ready? All right, you load. I'm uh, going to retire to a safe distance. That was the plan. Fire a cannonball, hit the caravan, blow up the caravan. And full disclosure, we were just firing a regular cannonball. We were going to tell you that. And then after it landed and smashed the caravan in, we were going to go in, replace it with a mortar charge, and blow it up. So, yeah, we'd simulate a little, but it's all above board. Provided we could hit the caravan. The reason it's difficult is because this isn't a cannon we're firing, it's a mortar. It's not designed to go through a thing, it's designed to go over a castle wall and hit somewhere inside a courtyard. Trying to hit what is actually a pretty small target is really difficult. But we did keep hitting the same target, it just wasn't the caravan. At one point, we hit basically within 12 inches five times in a row. So we moved the caravan to that position, Yeah, that didn't work either. We had one shot left. After that, we were out of black powder. We had to hit it with this one. We figured that was close enough, and we still had the mortar charge, so we figured for your entertainment, and for ours, we'd blow up the caravan anyway. Wow, 
that was amazing. And that is why no one wanted to live in a caravan in the Middle Ages. <laughs> now, let's take a look at a few of your shout outs. Um, just at the moment, we've got Alicia, who is nine from Hitchin in Hertfordshire, who once tried the glove of armour and couldn't even wiggle her fingers. Wow. Uh, Tracy Emmond and family are watching. They love the St. George legend. Uh, Ted's favourite legend is the legend of Edward I building Harlech Castle and the wars he fought within it. Um, hello from Emma, Rosie, Leo and Zoe in Devon. They love the jousting at Pendennis last summer. Fantastic. Hello from Erin, who's at age 11. Her favourite legend is the sword in the stone. We might be hearing a bit more about that uh, in another episode. And Sky, who's age 10, uh, says, we once watched jousting and bolts over castle and it was brilliant. Well, thanks for getting involved. And remember, we're going to be posing your questions to Jeremy uh, very shortly. But for now, I've still got a few of my own, Jeremy. Uh, and my first one is about this this change which castles had to live through and suffer from, and, and particularly uh, during the English Civil War. Technology has changed, weaponry's changed, uh, the, the knights are sort of ceasing to exist in the way that they're used to. Um, it's not a great time for castles, is it? No, it's not. And we've got a number of castles where actually during the, the conflict, the castle becomes a ruin. So, for example, uh, Scarborough Castle, not too far away from you, um, where you go and look at that now, the keep, the great tower in the middle, uh, is basically only half a building. Uh, the other half of the building was knocked out by cannon during the uh, dur dur during the battle. And Old Warder Castle in uh, Wiltshire is another one, is a beautiful one, where uh, that changed hands several times between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians, and eventually the Royalist owner needed to try to get it back from the Parliamentarians and placed a whole load of gunpowder in a mine underneath the wall, uh, which he hoped it would, would scare the, uh, ro the, the, the Royalist occupant into, uh, the, the, uh, the Parliamentarian occupant into surrendering it. But unfortunately, it went off prematurely and brought half the castle down. So some terrible things happened. But um, we just saw a picture of uh, Helmsley Castle in Yorkshire a minute ago, and that's a nice example of one where even getting through the conflict unscathed didn't necessarily mean that the castle would survive because the winners of the Civil War, Oliver Cromwell and the parliamentarians, um, they, rem they, they didn't like the fact that the castles had been used against them by royalist occupants. And so partly to make sure that, that this would never happen again, they had this uh, program that, that we now sometimes use the word slighting, which, you know, it, it, it sounds a bit quaint as if as if you're going around just being rude about them. No, what you're actually doing is taking down enough of the castle so that it just can't be used defensively again. And that's what's happened. Helmsley Castle, after that, that marks the end of its period of occupation and, 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 and you know, and, and functioning as a fortress. And all the way across the country, there are a whole load of them like that. We've been seeing pictures of Beeston Castle on its uh, very dramatic uh, site in, 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 on the top of a crag in Cheshire. Um, all in all parts of the country, there are castles that look just as ruined now as they would have done in the 17th century. And our task at English Heritage looking after them is to actually keep them in a stable condition, but as ruins still. Well, yeah, I was going to ask because castles have been through so much, uh, you know, gunfire, cannon, siege, battle, finding themselves in this state of ruin and disrepair. Why is it that, that we tend to preserve them in this ruinous state rather than restore them to their former glory? There's a real, there's a lot of reasons for this, Ben, and uh, some of them, and you know, I, I think some people will agree with and some people will disagree with. I mean, there, there are some practical points that to rebuild a castle is a very expensive thing to do and we've got you know 60 or 70 of them so it'd be very hard for it for us to do that uh secondly i mean as a historian i love studying castles but i would say that there's a number of them where it's you know that there are big gaps in our knowledge so actually just to to, to be absolutely certain that we were rebuilding it correctly that would be a really really hard thing to do but I think the final point, and for me, this this really matters, is the English Civil War is is a really important bit of our history. Actually, it, yeah, to me, it says quite a lot that these castles 
um, got involved in that conflict and that their, 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 their period of occupation came, came to an end in the way that it did. And I don't think that can be written out of history. So when you go to Goodridge, it's actually quite inspiring as well as in some ways quite, quite saddening that we have to tell that story of not just of the glory days of the castle in the Middle Ages, but actually the, the, the events that led to it, it coming to, it, to its end. Absolutely. And, you know, just because castles stopped being used as, as fortifications doesn't mean that they became redundant. Much like ageing pop stars, they've kept on reinventing themselves, haven't they? So what have castles been repurposed as in more modern times? Well, of course, there are a very small number of them, a, a, a small proportion of them that are still castles. So uh, your majesty, I know you're watching a great fan of, of these live lessons. Uh, Any time you would like me and my friends to come and help you with Windsor Castle, you know where we are and we're, we're always awaiting your call. Um, but that's a reasonably small number. And as I say, because the expense of maintaining a castle and all the staff that need to look after it and all that, that's not something that everyone can do. Um, there's a lot of variety in them. Um, you'll see a lot of castles that are, you know, museums or other kinds of heritage attraction. Um, but if we look back even within our own um, castle sites, I mentioned Framlingham earlier, and there's a really interesting and weird one where here's this building inside Framlingham Castle, which was a workhouse built in the 17th and 18th centuries to look after the poorest people in that community. And how ironic it is that the castle that had formerly been occupied by the very richest and most powerful, um, its last phase of life was actually for people who didn't have the resources to look after themselves and, you know, went into that castle to undertake work um, so that the community would then give them um, the substance on which to live. So, you know, it's th th there's a bit more variety that, than you might think. And, you know, dare I say it, the end, we, we haven't actually got to the end of the story yet. It would be very interesting for some of these, these castles to know, you know, what the next, you know, century or half century will have for them and you know i very much hope and pray that many of them will have you know ongoing uh, existence just as long as the history that, that that i have the privilege of working on absolutely and i'm sure uh, when there's people as passionate as you around jeremy castles will always have a place uh, in our society um and that does take us right up to the modern day doesn't it to a time where the only swords and shields that you're likely to find in castles now and the plastic ones in the gift shop, uh, which means it's time to take some of your questions uh, for Jeremy and see what you want to know about castles. So let's take a few of them, shall we? Uh, Sylvia, who is age six, hello Sylvia, asks if girls could be knights. How interesting, Sylvia. Um, no, it's one of those really unfair things. In the Middle Ages, girls could not be knights, um, only, only uh, men could do. Now, um, there is a sort of there. There is a girl's equivalent, a lady's equivalent that you you get made a dame, and and, and that would do. What I would like to say, though, however, is that just because they couldn't be made knights doesn't mean that they're that they couldn't be really important in the story of castles. And we've got loads of examples from all periods, from the Middle Ages and from the English Civil War, when men were unavailable to defend the castles, and it was the women who were in charge. And sometimes those stories are really, really heroic. Um, you, there, there's a whole lot of castles where, where that's the case. So the story of women in castles is very much not that they were just ladies in waiting and people who did the laundry. Sometimes they were really, really important. Fantastic and a great question, Sylvia. Thank you for that. Uh, Samuel, who's 10, wants to know, how did knights fight poorer people if they rose up against the king when they weren't supposed to fight people at a lower level than them? Yeah, um, what a fantastic question. And it, it was the great dilemma of knights that that was in a way was their job that they, they had to try to put other people down. And in other ways, it was, you know, as we've said, that wasn't chivalry, that wasn't fair, fair play. Um, Essentially, I mean, you know, what the way it was supposed to work was that knights were commanding other people who were lower down the pecking order, and it was they that would do the fighting against their equals. But sometimes, it, you know, it did happen. And I, I, the point that I would always want to make is that 
knighthood was just how you were supposed to behave. But warfare often was a really nasty business. And it was an ideal that often they just didn't live up to. And I think that's a, a really great example of it. So, you know, actually, the reality of being a knight was that you'd have to do some pretty dirty work, as well as um, have the, the status and the riding about and the fine lifestyle that goes with what we were talking about a bit earlier. And actually, this next question leads into that quite nicely, Jeremy. Ruben, who's age eight in Lincoln, asks, how often did knights pretend to be other knights uh, to trick people by wearing their coat of arms? You know what? I don't know the answer to that question, Ruben. So thank you for that. All I do know is that that's really against the spirit of, 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 of chivalry and coat of arms to pretend to be someone else. But heavens knows you might well win. And um, Ben's been, you know, this is not the last time. We're going to do another episode to do with the story of Arthur and other things. And that's got a really, really hideous example of someone pretending to be someone else and having consequences. But I'll save that one for a future episode. Thanks, Ruben. <laughs> oh, well, there's something to get excited about. Uh, this one comes in from Jimmy, who's nine. Uh, and he wants to know, were the rules of being a knight written down or was it passed down, perhaps orally? Um, no, it was written down. And there are lots of lots of books of this, as well as the oral tradition that would go with the, the, the ritual. And I talked a bit about the ritual of, of the of the bath. But actually, you know, that, that was only one part of something that took about two days to do. And one other little detail that you might well enjoy um, about all of this was um, as well, when uh, the new knight, having had his spurs put on, he then um, would have to walk past the chief cook of the of the Tower of London, who was be who would be waiting for him with his cleaver, and he would give him one of his spurs. The idea being that if he misbehaved and you know broke these rules that were written down, that the cook would be entitled to come after him with a cleaver and cut the other spur off um, his foot, and presumably do other things with the cleaver as well. So as well as having it written down, and there are, there are whole sort of books of knighthood um, that, that a knight would, would, would be expected to, to know intimately, the ceremony of making him a knighthood was, was distinctly designed so that the basic principles were dinned into him very hard and he wouldn't forget them. Well, it all sounds a bit of a faff, doesn't it? And uh, imagine how wrinkly you'd be if you'd sat in a bath for two days. Oh, I don't think I'd like that at all. Um, let's uh, have one more question, shall we? This is from Erin, who's age 11. She wants to know, was the cannonball made out of stone? Yeah, lots of cannonballs are made out of stone. Um, others are made out of metal. Uh, the stone cannonballs are great fun because when we find them, we don't know whether they are cannonballs necessarily or whether they might actually be um, weapons from earlier siege engines and there's a number of castles where they've been dug up and we put them on display with a dirty great question mark associated where we say I think this is a cannonball but it could actually be um, from from much earlier and could 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 have been from a siege engine so yeah they were as well as uh, uh, they were they were in in both materials and if you take a look at that picture as well that's uh, an example of how not to fire a cannon from behind a closed window it wouldn't uh do your house any good. <laughs> uh, yes, well, please be careful. Of the... Yeah, right, yeah, exactly, Jeremy. We've got to be careful. Try not to fire cannons in your own house. That's uh, a final word of warning. But that is all the time that we've got time for questions today. Uh, thank you uh, uh, all for your incredible questions and comments throughout. And Jeremy, thank you to you, as always, for your brilliant insight as well. It's been a joy to have you here. It's been lovely to be with everyone and uh, hopefully I'll uh, get to see you all very soon. Bye bye. Fantastic. Oh, and Jeremy, before you go, do you know what the difference is between you and Castles? I don't know, Ben. What is the difference between me and Castles? A castle had uh, some entertainment in the keep whilst you just keep us entertained. 
There you go. That's a Middle Ages joke for you. I snuck it in. Uh, thanks very much, Jeremy. We will be joined by Jeremy again very soon. And before uh, we go, there is just time to set our next creative challenge. So this week, we'd like you to create your very own shield, complete with your own personal coat of arms, as even the bravest of knights needs a shield for protection, uh, as we've been discussing throughout today. Uh, now, it can be uh, made from all sorts of materials. You can maybe use cardboard or anything that you've got at home that you think might work. Um, I'll show you mine here. I've uh, had some fun with this. So hopefully you can see this quite well. This is uh, my shield. I've got me there wearing a crown. Uh, which is wishful thinking. We've got the uh, Leeds United logo there. We've got to have that on any uh, any heraldry that I bring to the battlefield. I've got a TV because I'm on the TV and I like watching it too. I've got a dragon just in case anyone was lulled into a false sense of security by these. A the dragon will scare them off. So that's my design and uh, we'd love to see yours. So we'll drop a link in the comments uh, for uh, ideas on how to decorate your shield. Uh, maybe you could use animals or beasts or mythological creatures or anything that's personal to you like I have. And uh, you can send us your pictures by commenting on the photo that we'll put up of me with my shield uh, on the English Heritage Facebook page. Or you can use the hashtag History at Home Live. Well, I'm afraid that is all the time that we've got for now. We will be back next week for a fantastic topic, which you'll be uh, pleased to hear was voted for by you. Yes, it's Tintagel and King Arthur. I cannot wait for that one. And there's plenty more to look forward to over the coming weeks as well, including Summer Solstice at Stonehenge, uh, where we welcome back the original OG that is Susan Greeney, uh, Charles Darwin and Downhouse with the gardener Anthony O'Rourke, and finally Henry VIII and the Tudors with Roy Porter. Uh, don't forget to visit History at Home uh, on our English Heritage website. Just click on Visit and History at Home. Uh, you can find loads more information there. But for now, get designing your shields. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.